this is a subject of controversy, a subject of question. And many times when we think about the two witnesses, most people are thinking about who will they be. Uh, and, and I've seen all kinds of doctrines out there about the two witnesses. Some believe that it's the Old and New Testament. Some believe that it's um, Enoch and John. Uh, John the Revelator, the very one that actually wrote the book of Revelation, and uh, the Apostle John, I should say. Uh, some believe that it's actually uh, Elijah and Enoch. Some believe that it's uh, Elijah and Moses. There's, there's many different ideas about the two witnesses. But one thing that perhaps we haven't given enough consideration on is what is the ministry of the two witnesses? What will they actually be saying? What will they present to the people? What type of restoration will they bring? You know, normally we think, as, as, a, as a believing people, and for the Jewish people, we are believers in Yeshua to be the Messiah. And uh, the Christian people, which we're one and the same, those that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, we, we are cr Christian as well. I mean, some Jews don't like to hear that, but it's true. You are. You're Christ-like is what you want to be. It's we want to be like Christ. But yet there's all different kinds of denominational differences. There's all kinds of doctrines out there. We have the, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, the Presbyterians, the, the, the Methodists, the, the Catholics, everything you can think of. You know, even Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists, you know, all are claiming to be Christians, believers of Jesus Christ. Yeshua, HaMashiach, as the Jews would say. And even in Judaism, we have every type of sect of Judaism you can imagine. And, but the basic ones would be the Reform or the Orthodox or the Ultra-Orthodox or the Ascetic. But we have all types, even in branches, even in there. The question comes down, though, is what is right? And what would the two witnesses actually preach? Well, to start with, let's just look at the scripture regarding the two witnesses. There's two scriptures we can look at. One would be found in Zechariah, the two anointed ones. Remember, Zechariah the prophet asked the Lord, what be these two olive branches? Are these two olive trees that are on either side of the golden lampstand? And the angel that spoke with him said, knowest thou not? Now, I'm just paraphrasing. He said, these are the two anointed ones that will come to the whole earth. And then Revelation, John speaks about it here. We, 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 first, we see in verse 1 that they're going to build a temple. There's going to be an outer court that will be left out that's going to be built for the Gentiles. Interesting, isn't it? And which Gentiles is that outer court being left out for? Well, it may be, quote, unquote, the Christian people, but clearly the Vatican's hand is the one that will be part of this Gentiles that is there. They may use the Palestinians as a, a justification, but clearly nonetheless it is done for a space of 40, I think it is, let me look at it again, 40 and two months I believe is what it says here. And uh, um, where it is given unto the Gentiles is verse 2, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 uh, Foot 40 and two months. That's exactly right. Three and a half years. Half of the seven year covenant that is signed with Israel according to Daniel's prophecy. Then it goes on to say in verse uh, three, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Zechariah's prophecy, Revelation, John is clearly identifying them as the two branches at the, uh, on either side of the golden candlestick. Now, we saw a preview of who they would be because Yeshua, Jesus himself, he is that candlestick. And if he is the candlestick and on Mount Transfiguration we have Moses and Elijah on either side of him, then we don't see, we don't see what? We don't see the New and Old Testament on either side. We don't see uh, John there. We don't see Enoch there. We see Moses and Eliyahu. Moshe, Eliyahu, Moses, and Elijah are standing there with him. Now, would it be two men anointed with their spirit in this day? Maybe, but I can't say. Okay? Now, I've shared with you in time past many different prophecies that prove these things. Now, 
pretty much, hands down, most Christians are going to believe that Elijah is definitely one of the witnesses. But when it comes to Moses, many people don't think so because they say, well, the scripture says, it's appointed unto man once and to die, and after this the judgment. And Elijah never died. And of course, Enoch never died, but Moses did die, and so that's their justification. But the scripture that is quoted there has nothing to do with the appointed for once man to die, and then the judgment has any, nothing to do with Moses nor, uh, or excuse me, Elijah nor Enoch. Because the scripture, when you read the entire chapter to begin with, it's all referring to the Messiah. That when he would come, the whole scripture is about the Messiah, that he was only to die one time. He didn't have to die two times, three times, or anything else. And so it says in there, it is appointed once to man to die. That scripture is a prophecy clearly of Messiah, Mashiach, Yeshua. Nothing to do with us as individuals, which we can clearly see that. Judas, who was, uh, not Judas, um, um, Lazarus, who was loved of Yeshua, what did Lazarus do? He was raising, risen from the dead after being four days in the grave and had to die a second time. So it's not appointed in a man wants to die, meaning that every single man must physically die because the scripture clearly doesn't teach that, and we know that it's dealing only with the Messiah. Secondly, secondly, so therefore it does not knock Moses out as a candidate because he's died. Of course, Lazarus proves that he doesn't have to just only die once. He can die twice. Or the fact that Elijah never died, he's got to come back and die again anyway, or Enoch for that matter. But then we see the scriptures, many scriptures, where they've never been fulfilled. For example, God says to, to Moses, or Moses sings the song, See, I will sing unto the Lord that he has gotten victory over the horse and over his rider, and he's cast him into the sea. Not the horses and the rider, so therefore Moses in Exodus 15, verse 1 right there, is speaking of a prophetic event. Asherah, I will sing. See, I will sing that he's gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. And he has hurled them into the sea. One horse, one ride, rider. Now, according to the scripture, there were 600 that came down to the Red Sea with the chariots. So clearly, Moses is speaking of the Antichrist spirit that will be riding in the last days. One rider, one horse, and he'll cast them into the sea. Okay, so that's another prophecy. Another one is also found where God prophesies to Moses that he will do uh, uh, wonders like he's never done before. And God is prophesying these things after Moses has already come out, brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, after Moses is already parted the Red Sea by God's great miracle in hand, smith, smote the rock, brought forth the waters. All these things have already happened. Now goes, God says to Moses, I will take and do wonders with you like never before. And yet he dies and never fulfills it. God even says it'll be an evil that I will do. Because why? God is bringing judgment on the world. And God even tells him, when you come into the land that I've given you, make no covenants with them. Wow. Wait a minute. God said to Moses that he wasn't going to allow him to come into the land. But in here he says he's allowing him to come into the land. Has to be a future date. So prophecy still got to be fulfilled. Moses has to return. There's other ones. There's many other ones. God even says to Moses in another place, and in, in early on in Exodus, around um, Exodus chapter 4, I believe it is, when he, when he sits there and he gives him the sign of his hand to leprosy and cleansed, and then also the sign of the, uh, the staff turned to a serpent and back again. And then God says, if they do not hearken to the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. Now, clearly, it is biblically written they did not believe Moses. So therefore, God says, if they will not hearken or hear the voice of the first sign, they shall hear the voice of the latter sign. God clearly is showing that Moses would have more than one ministry. And we could go on and on and on and on. But my thing that I really want to get to is what kind of ministry will they have? Well, let's look at a little bit here. It says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years, just like the 42 months is three and a half years. Now, that is three and a half years according to the calendar that the Jews went by originally that was 360 days in a year, not the Gregorian calendar that's 365 and a quarter day in a year. 
These are the two olive, tree, uh, two, two, two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. There you go. That's Elijah. Eli what did Elijah do? He sits up on top of the hill. And, of course, the king uh, says to the, to, says to his, uh, sends a, a troop of 40, 50 men out there, go get him and bring him down here. And this captain goes up arrogant and tells him, he says, you're coming with us. And Elijah says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and devour you all. And God sends a, a, a fire that comes down out of the heaven and devours all 50. This happens two times. And then the third time when they sent the captain up with the 50, he bound himself before the ground in humbleness and humility. And then Elijah had mercy. Now, so there is your fire. When it says fire proceeds out of their mouth, I don't believe that it's a literal fire coming out of their mouth like a dragon. But the thing is, is what they say God will do. Like Elijah did. He called for the fire and it came. He spoke fire from his mouth, in other words. All right. Then it also says, uh, These have power to shut the heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, which Elijah did as well, and Elisha. And have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. That's Moses. Moses turned the water to blood and did what? Smit the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as he willed. In other words, as often as God told him to. And so this is the type of, this is, we get to see part of this ministry here. And then it says, of course, they're killed. After, it says, and, and uh, excuse me, and when they have, uh, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That is right in Jerusalem. Just recently, those of you that listened to um, Brother Paul Bagley and, on his ministry, I was with him there. We were speaking right there at Golgotha there, the place of the skull. And I even said to the people on his channel there that this is where the two witnesses will be killed is right here. And, and by the way, those of you that may not know, I, I haven't made official announcement as of yet, but uh, besides speaking here, and by the way, I am back in the United States. I'm here in Florida now. We, we made it in, uh, uh, I forget when we made it, just a day or so or something like that ago. Uh, but we finally got back in here. I'll be speaking with Brother Bagley at, at a conference he's holding at the First Baptist Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, Brother Dave, if you happen to catch this video uh, that lives down there in Fort Lauderdale, I believe his mother is the secretary of the pastor of that church there. Uh, definitely want to talk to you, my brother. Email me, stephenbennoon at aol.com. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about that. But anyway, Brother Paul asked me if I would speak there with him, uh, giving me liberty to speak what's on my heart concerning Israel and the prophecy, so we'll definitely be going into that. And I'll be talking a lot about this here on the two witnesses as well. Very, very serious message here. Uh, but anyway, so what happens here, they're killed, their dead bodies are laid in, left in the street there, right there, and then it says, uh, uh, and, they, and they of the people and the kindreds and the tongues and the nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented... Uh, them that dwelt on the earth, and after three days and a half, the spirit of, the, uh, of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now, we're just getting started here. So I've got some powerful things I want to share with you guys, and uh, I haven't got to the good part yet. But let's take a look at what Yeshua himself has to say, what Jesus had to say about the ministry of Elijah, because he talks about that, and we find that in Matthew chapter 17. It says here in verse 11, and Jesus, or let me back up a little bit to verse 9, and, they, and, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. What vision? This was when they actually on Mount Transfiguration, when Moses and Elijah appear with Yeshua. And as I've said, what is that? That was a prefigure that it is Moses and Elijah. It's no one else. It's not, it's not Elijah and Enoch. It can't be. 
It's appointed a man who wants to die, and after this, the judgment, and the scripture only applied to Jesus. So how could, it, how could it apply any other way? So clearly, God is defining it, because why? Yeshua meets with Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. They talk about what's going to happen to him, and then the question comes up. They're coming down the mountain, and they came down from the mountain, and Jesus charged them, saying, Tell me the vision of no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say that the scribes and Elias must first come? That's the question. They're saying that the scribes are saying that Elijah, Elias is the Greek word for Elijah, why then doesn't the, the, the Pharisee say that Elijah has to first come? Now watch what Jesus, how he answers this. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, or Elijah, truly shall first come. John the Baptist, by the way, is dead when this is going on. All right? What else does he say? And restore all things. This is a future ministry of Elijah coming. Now, there's, there's been many different religious ideas out there that people think that Elijah has come. I, I've seen all types, and, and, I, and I'm not going to limit it to one particular group or, or the other because there's several of them that believe that. And even today, uh, there, there's a, a man preaching down in Africa that people believe is Elijah the prophet. But if you really want to know if the spirit of Elijah is upon someone now, or it was on up, upon someone in the past, in modern times, you're going to find out in a few minutes if it matches the word of God. Okay? So anyway, he says that to him, that he shall restore all things. Then he goes on to say, now he's going to speak about John, but I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer of them. And the Bible says they understood that he was speaking of John. Now that's nothing unusual because in Malachi, Yeshua only applies part of a verse of Malachi's prophecy about Elijah to John. And he leaves out the other part altogether. Now Malachi says, let's take that real quick. You're, you're going to get a little bit deeper maybe than what I was even thinking about speaking on this, but, uh, but I'm, it's just really interesting what the Lord is making known. In fact, my wife found the scripture uh, that she shared with me, and, and uh, the scripture was incredible. It's something else that we were discussing, but when I saw the scripture that she shared with me, and it's going to be in the book of Jeremiah, I knew clearly that this was the ministry of the two witnesses. And I had not noticed before this. Now, in the Jewish Bible, for my Jewish brethren, we have Malachi chapter 3. We don't have a 4, but it still has the same words. It's just a continuation. Uh, after you hit verse 18, we go to verse 19, 20, 21, 22, uh, 23, and 24. And so we're going to go right in there. Let's, let's go down to verse 5. Uh, but in King James, it's, it's my, Malachi chapter 4. And we're going to start with verse 4, actually. It says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Let me tell you something. This is getting good. You guys, I, I pray, I, God, I pray you bless every person that listens to this. I used to wonder for years, what does verse 4 mean? Why is God saying, remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments? He didn't say that for no reason. I'm going to share with you in just a minute why he said it. Then he says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. John didn't live in the time of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And it says, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, Yeshua applied the first part of verse 6 to John when he says, Yeshua actually says, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. What was the heart of the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These are the fathers. Nowhere in, in, in all of the Tanakh do we ever refer to anyone else as the fathers. 
What was the heart of the fathers? It was to see Mashiach. And he turns the heart of the fathers to the children. He introduces the Messiah. That was their heart's desire, was to see him. But the second part he leaves out. Why? Because when Elijah returns in this day, the scripture says, and the heart of the children to their fathers. Because why? The children, the Jewish children, do not believe the commands of Moses. That's why it says in verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Wow. So Elijah's coming to do what? Yeshua said to restore all things. There's got to be something restored. Well, we all, we, it's pretty obvious something needs to be restored. Look at the chaos that we're in. Look at all the different doctrinal views, all the different denominations, all the different, even in, in Judaism, we have every kind of ideology. We have Orthodox, we have Hasidic, we have, uh, 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 oh gosh, uh, mo I would just call it modern, you know. We got, we got all kinds of things going on in Judaism, and, and none of them are right. None of them. If Christianity has got perfectness in it, and I'm not saying that the people are not Christians, there's many of them that love the Lord Yeshua. They love the Lord Jesus and, and believe him, and they're saved. I don't question that. I'm not talking about that. But the thing is, is something is missing because God has got to send Moses and Elijah. According to Jesus, Elijah is to restore all things. And what is one of the restorations? He's got to take them all the way back to Moses at Mount Horeb and restore it there? You mean to tell me that it went wrong somewhere at that point? Yes, it did. They were already getting off the word, even back then. We see that God had to start. He was opening up the earth, swallowing them. He was killing even the Jewish people that was eating manna in the wilderness. The lust that they had and the desires to do things that were not of God. Always something coming up. And he says, how long will I suffer you? This evil generation. And if it was evil then, what is it today? And Moses literally walked with them. Moses, a man of God that was in the presence of Almighty God on a daily basis. And they couldn't get it right. And they mocked him, made fun of him, and they didn't believe him. And yet, the Almighty come down in the pillar of fire on the mountain, and the whole mountain was a fire, and the earth did quake, and God spoke to Moses so that they would know that he was with them. They still didn't believe. Some did. I'm not saying that. Keep this in mind. When, I say, when I'm being hard like this, I'm not saying that all didn't believe. Some do believe. Even today, some do believe. But the thing is, the agenda of the churches and in Judaism to keep the truth hidden from you has been all the way down. Especially in the last 2,000 years since the Vatican got a hold of. So Yeshua said he's got to restore it back because it's been all tampered with. Malachi says that he's got to take them back all the way to the time of Moses with the laws that he was given in the statutes at Mount Horeb. And in Christianity, those that say, we well, you got to keep the commandments of God and everything, it says in Revelation, those that had the testimony of Jesus and keep his commandments. Yes. Now, I'm not talking about Judaism and the Pharisaic laws that have 613 commandments that are not in the Torah. It's not in the Torah. It's not biblical. 613 is not biblical. He gave 10. And then he gave maybe another 100 or so, 90, I forget. I actually tried to count them one time about the way of the light they should lead for cleanliness, holiness, 
the, 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 the high holidays, etc. Now, I want to share with you another verse here. Let me, before I go to the main one, I want to share with you. Let's go to Matthew 24. Now, I don't have um, the Hebrew Matthew, and I wished I did because it actually, they're translated pretty much the same, but in, the, in, in that particular Hebrew translation, it's actually better. It brings it out more clear. But in Matthew 24, um, he says here, um, let me back up. I've got to find the exact right place on this. Let's try here. I think, I think this is where it's at. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That's what the popes of Rome say. And many of them have come, and they all say that they are Christ. They take his place. Here, they're sitting in Peter's seat in the vicarious filiadilia, and I'm not a Latin person, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, but the point is it means instead of the Son of God or in place of the Son of God. So yes, they do claim to be Christ on earth, the anointed. So many shall come in my name and shall deceive many. And oh yes, the Vatican of Rome, not only have they deceived the majority of the Catholics in this world, and and many Catholics are coming out too. I thank God for that. But now they're deceiving the Protestants, and they're going right back to their mother. What a shame. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. It's been happening now for years. You know why? Because they never took you back to Horeb. And Horeb's a lot deeper than what you think. And because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel, notice, this gospel, this evangelii, as he says in the Hebrew text, of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Yeshua preached the gospel according to Isaiah 61 when he read from the scroll. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, the acceptable year of the Lord. To do what? To set the captives free. Wow. When Jesus said this gospel will be preached to all the world, this is the ministry of the two witnesses. The gospel that he preached is a setting at liberty, the captives, freeing the women as well. Not only the captives of the women, but do you know who else is in bondage? The people in the churches are in bondage to what? False doctrines. False doctrines. That's exactly right. Any man or woman that teaches that women are subject to the man less is not Elijah, and neither would they be Moses. God created you equally, just like he did in the Garden of Eden. And that's one of the ministries they they will come with. But there's a lot more than just that that they're going to come with. Let me take you to Jeremiah chapter 8. This is the clincher. This is the one my wife handed to me. Jeremiah writes here, How can you say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Now this is to my Jewish brethren, but it applies also to the Christian community as well that say they are wise. They have the gospel of Yeshua and they believe that they have it unadulterated. You do not. 
He says, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. You know what a scribe is? Let me read that to you one more time, though. He says, but behold, the lying pen. In other words, the guy that's writing is not writing what's truth of the scribes, the guys that is copying your Bible. Because back then it was copied from one book to another book. In other words, the whole Torah was copied by hand, word upon word, line upon line. Even the scripture says that the word must be upon word and line upon line. But Jeremiah actually says, but behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. They perverted it. They changed the words that God said. This is what happened even with the Christian Bible. Paul said, though I or an angel from heaven come and preach anything else than what I have come, said to you, let him be accursed. And they took his words and they interpreted his words that woman is less. They said that, Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach or a serpent have any authority over a man. Paul never said that. Paul said, I suffer not that woman to teach or to usurp authority over a man. They say that Paul said over here uh, that, 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 that she's to, 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 to remain in silence as also saith the law. There's not one law in the Torah that says she's to remain silent, but in the Talmud there is one that says that it is not, uh, that it is not permitted for a woman to speak that she is to remain silent, for his, her voice is not to be heard in the synagogue. That's why in the old ancient manuscripts it was in the margins, not in the actual writing there. Why? Because the question was sent to Paul because they were using what? The Talmudic tradition. They were given the oral law, what they call the oral law, which is not the law of Moses. It was traditions of man. That's why Jesus said you teach for doctrines the traditions of man. Do you realize the Jews are not the only ones guilty of this? My Christian brothers and sisters, that's taught in your churches as well. Paul didn't teach that a woman. He said, I suffer not that woman to teach or to usurp authority. Why? Because there was a woman coming in trying to bring the doctrine of Diana that the women were first enlightened and that it wasn't the man. And, of course, it wasn't the man anyway. God, God created Adam first, and that's why he says, not head ship. There's no head to the ship. But what did he say? The head of Christ is God. The head of the man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. In, in the Greek language, it means, that word there means the source. In other words, Christ come out of God. And Christ was the source, the creator of the man, Adam, Adama, from Adama, the ground. And from the man, from the mankind that was made by Adam, God took Eve, or Isha, she wasn't called Eve then, Isha, out of that being there. So he was the source, that body, that humanity was the source of the woman. And all, and all the other ones that they've twisted that Paul said. And we have it right here. Jeremiah prophesies of it. He says, because what? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it unto a lie. Interesting. Let's read what else he says here. The wise men are put to shame. They're going to be put to shame because the two witnesses are going to expose their lies. They're dismayed and caught. They're dismayed and caught. You're being exposed for your false translations. Not just in Christianity. Even. Even in the Torah. Torah. They're going to set it straight. That's why God says about Elijah, remember ye the law of Moses at Mount Horeb. They've got to set that straight too because the Jews have gotten it off too. Why? You're teaching all these laws for the doctrines of men, the doctrines of men for the laws of God, and that's not what Moses brought. The wise men are put to shame, verse 9. They are dismayed and caught. Behold, they are rejected. They, excuse me, they have rejected the word of the Lord. 
remember ye the law of God at Mount Horeb? They rejected the word of the Lord. And what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others, their fields to new owners, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone practices deceit. They brought in all these laws. Remember Jesus overthrew all the money changers at the temple? Released all the animals? I'm going to take you into these things before too long, and you'll understand. God's not playing church anymore. And that time is rapidly approaching that he must put his house in order. Because he loves you. This is why he will do it. This is why he's sending these two witnesses. Watch what he says here. They healed the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially. Saying peace, peace. But there is no peace. Because they've not kept the law. They didn't keep the law that God gave Moses in the beginning. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They certainly were not ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment shall they be brought down, says the Lord. I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine and no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf will wither, and what I have given them will pass away. In the beginning, go back and read Genesis if you want to know what he gave you. Pray for me. Pray for this ministry. If you really believe that God has called me to try to be a witness to you, then support this ministry as well. We need your help in that. I love you. I say things that hurt, and I know I do. I'm not trying to hurt you, though. I want you to see what the truth is. I want to be a voice, as I said recently in another message. I want to stand the way these two witnesses will, will stand. It's the ministry they're going to bring to you. I'd like for you to see a preview of what they're going to say. And I know the Lord. The Lord has spoke to me that I will actually speak to my own people. But he's given me the privilege to speak not just to the Jewish people but to my brothers and sisters of the Gentile faith or from the Gentile side as well. And it's an honor because he redeemed you with his own blood. Just know that I love you. Like I said, if you believe that God is in this, support this ministry. You can do so online at israelreturns.com. God bless you. We love you. We hope to see you in Florida. We uh, Two conferences here now. Brother Paul Begley asked me if I'd come speak at his in Fort Lauderdale, First Baptist Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, Sister Lisa Tesh in uh, Newport Ritchie, Florida, just north of Tampa, not far from Orlando, for those of you planning a vacation. 19th and 20th of uh, June here. This will be an incredible conference. My wife will be speaking as well in this conference. Sister Lisa Tesh will be speaking, and uh, hopefully we'll have Brother Alan Lamont speaking. Uh, uh, he'll be speaking uh, via uh, uh, Skype. We will broadcast him in big thing on the wall there. I've got to confirm that, though, with Brother Alan. I sent him a request for that, and I, I feel confident that Brother Alan will be a part of this. But we will be doing it at the meeting there. Nothing will be held back. We will be laying out exactly what's going on in Israel from a prophetic standpoint and letting you know just how serious it is. We'll be sharing with you the things that are happening that we see from another angle that you don't get to see here in America. So we hope that you'll be there and be a part of that. And God bless you. We love you dearly. We love you. And if you prefer, by the way, if you uh, and, and I don't mean to keep saying this, I only say it because in case you don't know, those that, that prefer to mail as far as doing gift not online 
If you look at our website, IsraelReturns.com, and under contacts is our address there that is here in the United States. God bless you and Shalom.